Well, good morning. Hope you're having an awesome Sunday morning. Hope you were able to tune in and uh, join us for worship and Pastor Craig's message. Um, junior and senior high Sunday school. Here we are from my office, um, chilling in my office, doing Sunday school now um, with the governor's new orders. It's a little uh, up in the air as to whether going to the church to record, you know, Sunday school is an essential um, activity or not. Um, man, it's it's crazy to me what is considered essential and what isn't. But church is closed, restaurants open, things like that. That's not for me to decide. It's just for us to try to remain faithful. And so here we are. I have a few announcements, uh, or just a couple announcements rather. Um, I'll have missions up as well. Um, rightnowmedia.org Scroll uh, over to the library's um, header over there on the left and then scroll down to EFC of Eaton and you can get to our training modules for junior and senior high missions. I know you guys are having a lot of problems with those. I know going through the quiz and you're submitting those and they're not coming in and it's not, I think their system, just like all of the systems are overwhelmed right now. And so don't worry too much about that. Don't stress too much about that. Just know your stuff. Those are just learning tools. Um, but if, if you would continue to go to those modules, um, I will send you all, if I have your email addresses, I will send you links to the actual new training module. There seems to be, uh, people seem to be having more success if you actually click that link, then go to it and um and then actually complete the training module through that link rather than just going and finding it yourself through rightnowmedia.org, if that makes sense. Um, if you get a link from me for the new training module, just click that link and go there in that way. And we seem to be getting more success um, from that method. Um, so anyways, with that. But the biggest thing is, man, keep studying your stuff. Keep learning that. Man, if you want to be part of the drama team, you know, or the uh, the uh, skit team, uh, rehearse those parts, learn those parts. We're going to get back together. And when we get back together, we're going to have to be able to hit the ground running. So um, please just be ready. Learn your stuff. Be prepared in season and out of season and be ready to go with that. As far as other announcements go, I'll just continue to remind you that Wednesday nights are available on the church's YouTube channel, EFC of Eaton dot or, or excuse me, EFC of Eaton. If you just go to YouTube and search EFC of Eaton, um, then pull up the church's channel. In playlists there, you'll see one for youth Sunday school and youth group on Wednesday nights. Um, I also post the links directly on my social media and stuff, or if if you want the link and you're just whatever, not on social media or whatever, just shoot me a quick text and I'll send you the link when those become available. But Wednesday night services, Sunday school, church on Sunday, everything will continue to be available by its um, you know proper time um, through the Internet, um, through YouTube and missions training through Right Now Media. So keep looking for those things. Hey, let's open up the Lord in prayer. And then uh, and let's continue with our study in Acts. Father, thank you for your goodness and your graciousness. Thank you for your love for us. Father, as we go to your word, I pray that you would tutor our hearts by your spirit. Speak to us, Father, and help us to learn what you want us to learn from this. Help us to take away what you want us to take away. Father, I pray these aren't my words, but yours spoken through me. Thank you for your goodness, your graciousness, and your love for us. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, guys. Uh, partly because we were going through this study, Reckless Abandon, on Wednesday nights. Um, I really wanted to go through the book of Acts because with the study, Reckless Abandon, we were um, considering what it would be like if we were fully committed to the Lord, if we truly made him our first priority and let him do with us what, what he pleased. Like how much of a of a benefit, how many kingdom rewards would we be storing up and and, and what could we do there? And so... When we look at um, the Bible, um, Acts is one of those books that really sticks out. Um, the early church, the disciples, literally Jesus has been crucified. Um, he's come back. He's shown himself. Um, Acts begins literally as Jesus is ascending into heaven. And he promises the Holy Spirit to come. 
He promises and he tells the disciples to stay in Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit comes and then they'll be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We see that in Acts 1.8. This is a little bit of review, by the way. And then we see as Peter, who had just denied Jesus three times um, at his arrest, and you know the disciples who were essentially running scared, now we're at the point where the Holy Spirit comes and Peter preaches at Pentecost to the, some of the very same people that no doubt arrested Jesus. Literally, we see the disciples begin to, um, at their, they're preaching and they're adding to their number. They're doing miracles and they're adding to their number daily than those that believe in Christ. They get arrested. Um, Peter and John go before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin tell them, hey, you know, uh, a couple different occasions, um, you know, they, they just flog them and release them and tell them not to not to preach this gospel about Jesus anymore. And lead, literally, Peter and John tell them, you know, judge with us, judge what, what is right, um, do with us what you will, in other words, but we cannot quit speaking about this. And I said it last week, I have to remind you that, man, this isn't like a little thing. This is, they have the ability to literally when they talk about flogging them and releasing them, it's like Jesus strapped to a post, you know, flesh ripped off your back, cat of nine tails stuff. And, and literally they flog them and release them and tell them, don't speak about this. And, um, and literally they're looking at him going, look, judge for yourselves what you must do. But as for, for us, we can't quit talking about this. Um, we see that the church comes together, that they, all those that were left in Jerusalem after Pentecost, many were in need and they were, selling their what they owned and they were giving to anyone who had need and uh and we see that the apostles they get persecuted and arrested again once again questioned by the the high priest they get locked up the angel comes breaks them out of jail immediately the angel tells them after breaking them out of jail now go right back out into the courts essentially and keep preaching this keep preaching this gospel and so literally that's exactly what they do once again they call the apostles in they have them flogged. They order them not to speak in the name of Jesus again. And uh, in verse 41 of, of Acts chapter 5, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for, for the name. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. So literally nothing was going to stop these guys. I mean, when we talk about, we just finished Wednesday night, part two of Audacious Faith. This faith that like is unstoppable, unmovable. I mean, this is it right here, man. This this book of Acts, um, literally these guys are modeling this and they're showing us what um, faith in Jesus that is absolutely audacious looks like. That takes us to our study. Our study is now today we'll be talking about Acts chapter 6. If you got your Bibles, which you should have, right? Because it's Sunday school and we always take our math book to math class. And so, uh, and you guys are all homeschooled now, so you're used to like having all your materials with you. So bring your, bring your Bibles when you come to this time in Sunday school and man, break that out. And, uh, let's look at Acts chapter six. So they had some issues going on. They were selling everything they had and they were giving to those who had need. And, and in chapter six, we see that there's a new, new problem. Um, and so I just want to read up a little bit. We're going to skip around some because I want to get through, um, actually, I want to get through some at least about chapter seven as well. Um, actually, looking at my notes, I want to get through all of Acts chapter seven too, if we can. So um, Acts chapter six is pretty short. We're going to bounce around a little bit. We're going to try to get through it. So starting in, in, in chapter six, verse one, we read this. In those days... When the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So you remember they were giving to each one as they had need. Well, these widows were being overlooked and straight up um, the 12, they gather together and they come up with a solution for this. They're going to choose seven and their their responsibility, their role is going to be to make sure that these widows are taken care of. You know, we get a lot of great teaching from passages like this, this reality that that ministry that God accepts, we see this elsewhere in scripture, is that ministry to widows and orphans. There's this reality that we're always supposed to care for and take care of those that 
that maybe are hindered a little bit in taking care of themselves. A great application even for this time right now that we find ourselves in. And many of us find ourselves scratching our heads going, what can we do to help in a time like this? You know, we want to be people of audacious faith, but uh, audacious faith. But what does that mean? Um, how can I help when we're not even supposed to have social interaction? Man, you know those people that are at high risk. Give them a call. Check up on them. Find out if they need anything. Maybe it'd be safer for you to go to the grocery store, pick up some things for them and, and drop it off for somebody that's maybe high risk than for them to have to go out and get it themselves. A lot of different ways that we can help. Some you guys, I know some of you guys are already helping. I've heard of of those of you helping with the food bank and helping distribute things. We've had some nice notes left on our porch and our door as well. And so thank you guys for considering others uh, more important than yourself and putting them first. But so the disciples, they, they're, they're very intentional about this and they get seven and they, they put them to work and, and this is their job and they're supposed to, to take on this ministry and, and they're going to oversee it and make sure that it's done and done well. That takes us down to verse 8. This is one of my uh, favorite passages. I say that a lot, but man, I really like this passage of Scripture, mainly because Stephen is such a man of God, and it's mind-blowing again in the face of suffering, in the face of what he's going through here, just his reaction. And so in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, we begin reading this. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue and the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as provinces of Cilicia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. So let's stop right there for a second. First of all, Stephen, full of God's grace and power. And we know back from Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit came down on him. And they became witnesses, right? And so he's got the Holy Spirit, and we see that here. Even as these men began to argue with Stephen, they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by whom he spoke. So it wasn't by his power he spoke. It was by the spirit who dwelt in him, literally the spirit speaking through him. The fact that the spirit is so in him and he's being led by the spirit is going to be important here as we read on. And I'll refer back to that passage in a minute. But... Literally, he was doing incredible things, miraculous signs and wonders. And these guys, again, these religious leaders, they're stepping up and they're opposed to him because, again, he's he's taking attention away from from them and and the religious movement that they once held and that they they preached. And in their he's he's drawing attention to this truth of Jesus Christ. In verse 11, we see what they did. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and of God. So now they're stirring the pot. They're stirring up trouble here. So they stirred up people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw his face. Now I got to stop here for a second. And I want to emphasize this. They saw his face was like the face of an angel. What exactly does that phrase mean like the face of an angel? Interestingly enough, in this occurrence, what he's really talking about, um, it actually goes back to 2 Corinthians 3, 7. It's this reality that with the Holy Spirit, Stephen shined. His face shined like the face of an angel. He glowed. Um, literally, as these guys are bringing false testimony, false witness, they're testifying against him. The very people that had arrest, arrested uh, the disciples before. Some of the same ones probably that were involved in the arresting of Jesus, the Sanhedrin here. Here we go. They look intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Um, just for kicks real quick, turn to 2 Corinthians 3, 7. What he's talking about here is this, it's this idea that literally our winter retreat was um, themed after. This, uh, this idea of Moses and when he went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, he was in the presence of God. When he came down off the mountain, 
He literally shined. He literally glowed like you could visibly see that. And we've talked about this idea in Sunday school and in Wednesday night, this reality that now we have light sensing instruments that are sensitive enough that we can literally measure the amount of light that somebody reflects or shines by the energy they give off. They literally give off light. We've talked about the reality of a popular mechanics article that was out there that literally stated there seems to be a, a direct correlation between the amount of light someone gives off and their degree of faith practice, I believe is how popular mechanics put it. So there's this reality that the more we press into God, the more that we allow his Holy Spirit to shine through us, the more light we literally shine or reflect. It gives whole new meaning to this idea of letting your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This idea that he is the light, that he brought light into the darkness, um, that literally through Jesus Christ, this world has light, that we are his lights. In verse 7, uh, if you turned with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I just want to reread this as a reminder so you know what Stephen's got going here. It says this, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in the letters on stone, came with glory. So now the word glory here is the same word that we see. We're talking about light. And he's talking about this ministry that brought death. When Moses was there, he's referring back to that with the Ten Commandments. He said, If the ministry... Um, that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses. Because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? So again, we're referring back to Moses coming down off the mountain, this reality that he glowed so intensely that they literally, literally the Israelites could not look at him. Like you need sunglasses literally to look at this guy. And I've made the comment before, I don't know about you or I, but I feel I fall a little short here in this category because I've not yet come into anyone's presence and they had to put on shades um, just to keep from being blinded by the light I'm giving off. That tells me I've got some growing to do somewhere, some pressing into God. Maybe there's there's things that I'm squelching the Holy Spirit with, uh, quenching his fire, and I'm not letting that light shine. But... In verse 9, he says, If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness or grace? So what we're talking about is the difference between being in God's presence, um, getting the book of law, getting the law, the, the Ten Commandments, being in God's presence, and Moses glowing. How much more should we glow who we have the ministry that brings righteousness or, or grace? Literally, the Holy Spirit is what he's referring to that dwells in us. As we read on in verse 10, it says, For what was glorious has no glory now in the comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? So again, just a nod back, a reminder back to what we've learned in the past about the fact that we, because we have the Holy Spirit, should literally be shining forth. And when we talked about this, idea in the past. We've talked about the reality that people are drawn to the light. Darkness brings fear. When we're kids, we're afraid of the dark. Um, even now, you know, we have to work against that fear sometimes as adults. Sometimes the dark is a scary thing, but we know that the light and it, it just exposes all things and it, and it gives us comfort. And we know when you go to the mountains, man, the first thing you want to do when you get up to the mountains camping is build a fire because it gives light and it feels like it gives protection and and it gives us comfort, excuse me. And we can be that in this hurting and this broken and this lost world as we shine. And so all that we're sitting back in Acts chapter 6, verse 15. Back in Acts chapter 6, verse 15. And so that all that were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. As we read on in chapter 7, we get this. Then the high priest asked him, are these charges true? I love this. Once again, here he is. He's at the place where he's before the Sanhedrin. For all he knows, he's about to be flogged, um, literally beaten within an inch of his life, maybe crucified, uh, killed, martyred, whatever. 
And again, the high priest asks them, are these charges true? To this he replies, brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and go to your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So now literally, let me just summarize. Literally what Stephen does, the high priest asks him if these charges are true. And Stephen goes into literally telling him the story of Abraham, of Isaac after him, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. And he literally goes on, if you look through there and you read, and, and I encourage you to study through this this week. But literally most of Acts chapter 7 is all about Stephen giving him a little Bible lesson, a little history lesson with everything that's transpired. Literally talking about all of this Old Testament scripture, Stephen's literally preaching to the Sanhedrin, preaching to the choir, so to speak. He's reminding them of this is our God. This is what our God has done. And he is faithful and he is just and he's going through all of these things. And then he wraps it all up in verse 51, Acts 7. He starts wrapping it up and he says this, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. I don't know about you, but where I come from, those are fighting words. Like nobody ever wants to hear, you're just like your mom or you're just like your dad. The truth is, guys, our moms and dads are not perfect. They've made some mistakes. Just like someday you'll have kids, you make mistakes. Trust me, uh, I'm not the perfect father. Jody's not the perfect mother. But man, for our kids, you know, they see those things. They grow up with them. They live with them. Uh, it's 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 this reality that when when you hear that you're just like your father from a negative tone or you're just like your mother from a negative tone not an encouraging one because there's a lot of things that our parents have done right as well and it's a totally different thing when people say oh man you're just like your dad in this regard or whatever and it's a it's an encouragement thing but that's not what he's saying here this is the other thing this is the uh the worst thing that your dad or your or your mom does and, and they're telling you you're just like them and so in 51, we get this, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? He goes on and he talks about all these guys. And then he says, is there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect through the angels, but have not obeyed it. Again, this reality of, man, are these accusations true, Stephen, that you've been doing? And he goes into this big, long uh, history lesson of biblical history and all of these prophets. And then literally um, tells them they're just like their father. Is there ever a prophet that you didn't persecute? You even killed Jesus. Um you even killed Jesus. And he goes on. Um, in verse 54, then we read this. When they heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. That gnashing of the teeth, it's like, get him. Like, that's what I envision. Like, these are fighting words, just like I said earlier. When they heard this, they were furious. They gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, again, full of the Holy Spirit. We got to keep going back to that because this is where Stephen gets his strength. Full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, apparently here, Stephen gets a little glimpse. He looks up and it's like God gives him this image, this little picture of what he's about to experience, it seems. And he says, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. As they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Now, let me remind you again, Stephen knew this was coming or at least he anticipated it. Maybe not stony. Maybe he thought he might be flogged. Maybe he thought he might be crucified, but he knew what he was getting into when he said it. And he, and, and yet he still, he gives them the truth. He preaches the truth to him when perhaps it's the toughest situation you could ever be in to preach the truth. It's like literally tempting you. Now go ahead. Don't talk about this Jesus anymore. Now, what are you going to do? And he literally starts preaching to them, literally gives them a, a biblical history lesson, and then literally tells them about the Jesus that they crucified. He, full of the Holy Spirit, they cover their ears, yelling, top of their voices. They rush at him. They drag him out of the city. 
and they begin to stone him. Now, let me remind you, stoning isn't like kids throwing rocks on a playground. It's not like the little pea gravel that we sweep off the concrete when we do Project Serve over at the elementary school. That's not what it is. Stoning back in the day was literally this idea of getting a rock as big as you could hold, everybody surrounding you, a mob of people, and they literally would oftentimes start at the limbs and they work their way up. And it's just this torturous abuse, one of the most horrific ways to die, getting stoned to death by stones. If somebody um, had some mercy, they would take the biggest rock they could carry and they would maybe throw a death blow your way that would, you know, ultimately kill you. But it was slow and it was painful. And so literally that's what they've begun to do. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, what were they doing? They were taking their clothes off, man. You ever see these videos or sometimes they're YouTube videos or uh, I don't know, these guys get ready to fight and the first thing they do is rip their shirts off or hockey players do this a lot, right? The first thing they do is they take their helmet off or whatever. I've always wondered if you're going to get in a fight, maybe you want to keep your helmet on. But anyway, they start taking their stuff off. That's what's happening here. They're getting ready to stone and man, they need moon, moon, room to move. So they're, they're taking off their, they're taking off their cloaks. They're, uh, they're taking off their robes. The male lady's bringing mail out here and Toby's barking. I hope you can't hear that. Um, but they're taking off their clothes and they're laying at the feet. They're laying them at a feet at the feet of a young man named Saul. You remember this guy, Saul? Same one. Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now there's this reality that again he's got this holy he's got the Holy Spirit with him, Stephen full of the Holy Spirit, so bold, so um, just absolutely courageous in the midst of it. But get this, something that we saw before, we saw it from Jesus when he was being crucified, and now here it is, Stephen taking what he's what he's known about Jesus and he's literally allowing it to mold and make who he is. Check out what Jesus, what what uh, check out what. Stephen says here, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep and Saul was there giving approval to his death. Guys, there's this reality that Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, even in the middle of his stoning, literally had the heart of Christ. He literally had experienced the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, and he had become the gospel. It's what we've been talking about on Wednesday nights. He literally, when we talk about loving others the way that Jesus loves them, um, loving others as ourself, literally as he's being stoned, Stephen is crying out to God, God, please receive my spirit. Forgive these people. Forgive their sin, for they don't understand what they're doing. Reminiscent of Jesus on the cross, Scripture records, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Lord did not hold this sin against him, even praying for the ones who were stoning him. Guys, a lot, a lot, a lot of application in these passages for us. Man, we look at things in our world today and we scratch our heads and we can't help but wonder why. I have to remind you over and over that God is in control. And sometimes, even though he is in control, things come with suffering. Sometimes in this life, we're going to be uh, subjected to sicknesses to disease there may be some financial challenges whatever the case may be but even during this time of having to to separate and be home and man we miss you guys i'll be honest this is so weird man talking to a camera i'm not a blogger i'm not a i'm not a video guy all the time that's just not me um and so this is challenging we miss seeing you guys it, it's hard to get into delivering a message um, preaching the word of God without seeing your eyes and seeing your faces. And we hope you all are doing well. And I want you to reach out if you've got questions or challenges or have prayer requests. We want you to read, reach out to us. But for each one of us during this time, as you press into scripture, ask what God would have you do during this time to love on your friends, love on your neighbors, um, to get the truth of his gospel out there. What does that look like in this time? Definitely, we know that he promises peace that transcends all understanding. 
Uh, even when we're fearful, even when we're scared, may we not forget that he's always in control, that he is totally sovereign, that none of this is a surprise to him, that literally he puts our leaders and authorities in place. There's not authority that we have that hasn't been instituted by him, according to Romans chapter 13, and that he directs their heart. Um, he's in control. Um, he could make it all go away in a second, but for his purpose, uh, in this time, apparently we must be supposed to be enduring this and just help us to be faithful during that time. Help us to glorify and honor him uh, in such a way that people see our attitudes and our hearts and our love and uh, they know we have him. They know that we have Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Father, that you teach us by your spirit. Thank you that we can still come together through social media or whatever and that we can experience you, uh, your spirit teaching us from your word. Help us, Father, to take what we hear, what we read, and apply it to our lives. Father, we pray that we might be true lights for you in the midst of this dark world. Father, help us. Give us eyes to see your people the way that you see them. Help us to see every circumstance the way you see it. Break our hearts over the things that break yours. Father, those people that are in need, those people maybe that weren't able to get enough groceries or those people that don't have the finances to get the groceries because they don't have the job right now. Father, make us aware of those people. Help us have an idea of how to help them. Um, guide and direct us and help us to be sensitive to your spirit's leading. I pray for each one at home that they would take this time to press into you and, and press into their families and um, just uh, enjoy their time together. Everybody's got this big vacation now time. Well, not everybody. Some are still out there working. And Father, we think of them as well. We think of those essential personnel that are out there working and definitely our medical workers and our first responders. And Father, our officials, we thank you for them and for their um, faithfulness. And um, Father, we just pray. We pray for our medical workers, Lord, and those that are on the front lines here um, being exposed and exposing themselves for the sake of caring for others. Thank you for our truck drivers and all those personnel, our, our grocery store workers and people that are uh, making sure that those essential services are still out there. Father, thank you for all of that. Thank you most of all, Father, for Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. We love you guys. Um, tune in to uh, Missions Practice. And then other than that, look for Wednesday night when it comes out. Hope to see you all soon. We'll talk to you later.